Remember back in single variable calculus, we could find the maximum and minimum of a function by setting the function's derivative equal to zero and solving for x. The idea was that a function attains a local max or min where its tangent line is flat. This carries over in the world of multivariable functions to setting the gradient of our multivariable function to zero, which is equivalent to setting all partial derivatives equal to zero and then solving the resulting system of equations. This works fine as far as it goes, but very often in real world settings, we have additional constraints that restrict the values of our variables. This means our independent variables x and y are not free to roam around anywhere we like in the plane, and are restricted to some region or curve and are not allowed to take on values outside of it. As a result, the graph of our function is now a surface with a boundary, and the absolute maximum or minimum of the function could occur on it, and in fact, it often does. This can be a problem because if the max or min does occur on the boundary, the gradient doesn't have to be zero there. That is, the surface doesn't have to be flat there. This is just like how in single variable calculus, when finding the max or min of a function on some closed interval, you had to check the endpoints, or boundary, of the interval in addition to the flat points when determining the absolute max or min because the curve did not have to be flat at the endpoints. Likewise, in addition to the flat points on the surface, we also have to check the boundary of the surface for local maxes and mins. However, it turns out finding maxes and mins on a boundary curve is not as easy as it might look at first glance, and so finding a good way to do that is what we'll focus on for the rest of the video. So what makes this so difficult? Back in single variable calculus, it was pretty straightforward to deal with a boundary because with single variable functions, you only have two boundary points to check, the left endpoint and the right endpoint, and so you could just evaluate the function at both to see if either of them were an absolute max or min. But with multivariable functions, the boundary is a curve, and a curve contains infinitely many points, which means we can't just plug all of them in one by one to see which is the highest and which is the lowest. One way you could deal with this is to parametrize the curve, which means varying a parameter t that moves a point along the curve and keep track of the height of the point as t varies. This would turn the problem of finding the max or min on a curve in 3D space into a single variable calculus problem of finding the max or min height as you vary the single variable t. Although that's one way to do it, the method we'll look at in this video is a bit different. It's called the method of Lagrange multipliers, which is a pretty clever trick that allows us to avoid the hassle of parametrizing the curve and then having to solve a single variable max and min problem. How can we do this? Well, remember that whenever we solve a max or min problem, we make use of some criterion that indicates where the max or min could occur. In single variable calculus, or in the case of parametrizing our boundary curve, that criterion was having the derivative of the curve set equal to zero. The logic was, if a function has a max or min in the middle of a curve, it has to be flat there. So what we're looking for here is some other criterion that indicates a max or min on the boundary curve that doesn't require us to somehow take a derivative along the curve itself, which would require parametrizing the curve. How can we do this? To begin, let's first consider how this boundary curve arose in the first place. I said it comes about because of some constraint imposed on the independent variables. But what kind of constraint? Actually, a constraint can be expressed in many different ways, but for Lagrange multipliers to work, we need to have the constraint expressed in the form of some expression involving x and y set equal to a constant. That is, the constraint must look like g of x and y equal to k, where g is some multivariable function and k is some constant. An example might be this one, x minus 3 squared plus y minus 3 squared equal to 4, which means x and y are constrained to a circle of radius 2 centered about the point 3 comma 3. As you can see, the left-hand side of this equation is a function involving both x and y, but the right-hand side is just a constant. With this in mind, let's refine exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for a criterion which indicates a local max or min on the boundary curve that doesn't require us to parametrize the curve. That means we would like to express the criterion 
only in terms of the original surface function f, along with the function g and the constant k, which make up the constraint equation. But how can we do this? f and g by themselves define surfaces, and k is just a constant. How can we use information about two surfaces and a constant to get information about a curve? Namely, where along it is it highest and lowest? Let's first take a closer look at the constraint equation. Something about it might look familiar to you. Namely, it looks like the equation of a level curve to the surface described by the function g of x and y. As a reminder, the idea behind a level curve is it represents a set of points in the two-dimensional xy plane where the surface is, well, level, that is, at a constant height or value. This corresponds to the intersection of a surface with a plane parallel to the xy plane, which has a constant z-coordinate. A good analogy here is to imagine the function g as describing some terrain, and k represents the surface of a body of water. Where the water meets the terrain, what you might call the shoreline, is what we mean here by a level curve. As you vary the value of k, you vary the height of the water and get different shorelines, or level curves. Another way to think about this is if I recolor the surface based on the surface's z-coordinate, what you might call elevation, at any point, you can think of level curves as being all points of the surface that have the same given color. Now, there's one fact about level curves that I want you to pay close attention to here. That fact is that the gradient vector to a surface at any point on a level curve is always perpendicular to the level curve at that point. To put it another way, the direction of steepest ascent, or descent, at a point on a surface is always perpendicular to the level curve containing that point. If we take a step back for a moment, this should make some intuitive sense. If a ball is rolling down a steep hill, and you block the ball's path with a barrier placed perfectly perpendicular to it, the ball will stop and will neither roll to the right nor roll to the left, which means the barrier is perfectly level to the surface it's sitting on. So what does this tell us about our current problem? Well, since our constraint, g of x and y equals k, can be thought of as a level curve, this means that the gradient of g must be perpendicular to the constraint curve everywhere along it, because the constraint curve is a level curve of g. But wait, if you remember the surface I showed you earlier, the boundary curve of that surface didn't look very level, so why am I saying it's coming from a level curve? Actually, this is just a misunderstanding, but a forgivable one since we have so many things going on in this problem right now. The boundary curve of the surface is certainly not a level curve of the surface because it's not contained in a plane. But this original surface is not the surface I was referring to when saying this constraint curve was a level curve. Remember, we actually have two surfaces we're dealing with in this problem. The surface coming from the function f, which is the one for which we're interested in finding the max and min on its boundary, but we also have a separate surface coming from the function g, which appeared inside the constraint equation. And I'm saying this g surface has a level curve that gives us this elliptical constraint curve. I actually haven't shown you yet what the g surface looks like, so here it is. As you can see, one of its level curves, this one, gives us our elliptical constraint curve. So the constraint curve is a level curve of the g surface, but the surface we're really interested in finding the max and min on is the f surface, and a level curve of g doesn't have to be a level curve of f. In fact, f and g really don't need to have anything in common at all with each other. So just remember that f is the main surface we care about, and the g surface is just quietly in the background helping us to define the boundary of our f surface. But don't worry too much about picturing the g surface. For our purposes, its exact shape isn't that important. All I want you to take away for now is that the gradient vector of the function g, whatever it happens to look like, is perpendicular to the constraint curve at all points along it. But now let's take a look at the f function and its boundary curve. 
Remember, our goal here is to find some criterion or equation that indicates where on this boundary curve the F surface could have a max or a min. Just so we have something concrete to look at, let's say we're interested in finding a max. The logic is the same for a min. Based on examining the picture, it looks like this point right here is the surface's highest point on the boundary curve. Do you notice anything about it? Well, going off of what we know from single variable calculus, since we're considering a maximum that's sitting on a curve, that point must occur where the curve is flat. But if the boundary curve is flat at that point, then it must mean that the gradient vector of the f function is perpendicular to the curve at that point. That's what we observed about level curves earlier. But remember that this boundary curve really came about from a level curve of the g function, the equation g of x and y equals k. That means that the gradient of the g function is also perpendicular to the constraint curve at this point. So at this privileged maximum point, we find that f and g do have something in common with each other. Their gradients are both perpendicular to the constraint curve, which means they are parallel to each other in the xy plane. So at long last, we have found the criterion we were looking for. The maximum, or minimum, of a function f of x and y subject to a constraint g of x and y equals k must occur where the gradient of f is parallel to the gradient of g. Actually, there's one small change we can make to this statement that will make it more usable in solving a concrete problem. Remember that if two vectors are parallel, it means that one is a scalar multiple of the other. So another way we can express this criterion is to say that the gradient of f is equal to some constant scalar lambda times the gradient of g. This constant lambda, by the way, is called a Lagrange multiplier, which is where this technique gets its name. Okay, so now that we have this criterion, how do we use it to solve an actual problem? The idea is to take this criterion, that the gradient of f equals some constant lambda times the gradient of g, and decompose it into a system of equations by equating like components. Put this together with the equation g of x and y equals k for the constraint itself, and you get a system of three equations and three unknowns. The solutions to the system will be the candidates for where the function f is maximized or minimized along its boundary curve. And as usual, the candidate that gives you the highest value of f is the maximum, and the candidate that gives you the lowest value of f is the minimum. You may also notice that you can solve for the Lagrange multiplier lambda itself. Although if your purpose is just to find the max and min of the function on its boundary, you can actually just ignore the results for lambda. Lambda is just there as part of the setup, but doesn't contribute anything to the final result.